So here it is, this is the Backman Class 101 DMU. I've been waiting for one of these for a very long time. I can remember sitting at my computer probably two or three years ago and uh, I saw on the Backman website that they'd announced they were going to be doing one of these and I immediately thought, whoa, I've got to have one of those. So uh, here we are and it's finally arrived. I'm going to give this one one of my uh, full reviews. Um, I'll go through just about everything I can think of and also give you a brief history on the, the prototype. Um, the 101 is quite a significant DMU in terms of railway history and uh, it's certainly uh, very appropriate for many, many layouts of all locations and eras. Class 101s were built from 1956 until 1960 and they would have entered service probably in late 1956 and then gradually as the years went on you would have seen more and more of them appear. They were primarily designed to operate on lines where the number of passengers was relatively low and it was not uh, commercially viable to operate a full locomotive and a rake of coaches. Um, they are in effect a cheaper alternative um, and a way to keep lines open that may have otherwise been shut. Um, you could see them all over the country on all sorts of routes and workings and there were a number of configurations. Um, as I say, they came into service in about 1956 and the last examples of Class 101 were withdrawn from mainline service on the 24th of December 2003. That makes those particular units have a service life of about 47 years. That's absolutely astounding. If you think about cars of the period when these were built, so let's say 1956, um, cars of the period then could not be reasonably expected to last more than 10 years before they just rusted away. So for these things to be in revenue service from 56 to 2003 is simply amazing. The unit was available in a variety of configurations from the builder in the 1950s. Um, this particular one represents what was called a power trailer. Uh, that is basically a unit with an engine in it that moves the train and an unpowered unit that is purely there to seat passengers, hence the term power trailer. You could also get a unit called a power twin. Um, power twin is fairly self-explanatory. Um, you had two units both equipped with engines, so you had a two-car unit that had better performance. Uh, there were approximately 30 power twin sets originally ordered. There were also 74 free car variants. They consisted of a power car, and then you had a trailer second, so just a coach effectively, and then you had another power car at the other end. The final configuration was a four car unit, 28 of these were built, and that consisted of a, uh, a power car again, you then had a trailer, a buffet car, and another power trailer. So that was probably quite, quite a nice thing to look at really, and certainly would look good in model form, so hopefully in a few years Backman may do a four car variant. Power cars were fitted with two engines, and uh, they varied in configuration. You could get Rolls-Royce, AEC and Leyland. It depended on when they were built and uh, what was going on at the time with the order. Uh, the engines produced a mighty 150 horsepower. So uh, that really isn't very much. It really isn't a lot at all. They're probably not that fast. Um, top speed of them was about 70, although later in life I very much doubt you could get them up to 70 anymore. Um, they were overhauled not that frequently, they were all rebuilt in the 1970s when uh, British Rail sort of scratched their head and went, oh, we haven't actually got anything to replace these, uh, let's, uh, let's just keep using them. Uh, so they were rebuilt in the 70s and then subsequent uh, uh, overhauls were done um, to varying levels on some units, um, which ultimately ended up with the final units lasting until 2003. Okay, so that's a brief history for you. These units were very numerous, very successful, appeared on pretty much all regions of British Rail and were in service for about 47 years. So they are extremely uh, prototypical and accurate and good to have on uh, a great variety of layouts. So now let's go in for some close-ups on this particular model and uh, see how it stacks up. If we take a look at the front of the unit, you can see the uh, the face of the 101 is very nicely captured. 
Um, we've got uh, a variety of separately applied details, such as windscreen wipers, and uh, there's also some lamp irons down here on the uh, buffer beam. Um, the model is fitted with directional lights, and uh, also the uh, destination up at the top over the middle window is also illuminated, which is a nice feature. Buffer beam detail is excellent. Everything you would expect to see there has been represented. Um, the items here come in the typical bag of bits that you get in the box. Um, I have fitted those and uh, you'll see shortly what the model looks like um, with the tension lock couplings fitted. Um, it came with uh, NEM couplings and uh, it just has a standard NEM coupling pocket at what I believe to be the correct height. Um, so you can swap any coupler in there if you're choosing. Looking inside the interior, we can see that um, it's been very nicely detailed. Um, all the seats are uh, present and correct, and uh, they're painted in your typical uh, typical blue um, that most of the interiors uh, seem to be painted in these days when you buy a model. Something that I particularly like is the representation of the uh, the door for the driver here with the uh, the windows in it. Something that was really nice about these early DMUs is the uh, the wood wood sort of divide that ran behind the cab that had the driver's door in it. Um, that wood divide had windows in both the door and the panels either side and if you were sitting say in the first or second window here you got a fantastic view out the front of the unit as the uh, driver took it down the track. There is also a nicely detailed cab interior although it's very difficult to see due to the uh, small window um, through the driver's door. However, there are uh, a number of separately applied bits and pieces, including a brake wheel and uh, a couple of other bits and pieces, as well as seats. Um, it's nicely represented, and uh, I think I may add a driver in there at some point. Moving down to the rear of the driving trailer, you can see the uh, guard's compartment. Um, something that I particularly like is the uh, nice uh, separately applied metal handrails that have been put around the guard's door. Um, just further ahead of that you can see the uh, two small windows for the guards compartment um, however you can't see through these because that is taken up by the uh, block which houses the motor and gearbox for the model. Looking between the two cars uh, we can see that we have uh, got sprung buffers uh, which I know uh, a lot of you like. Um, personally I see no point whatsoever in sprung buffers um, all they do is make the model more expensive. Uh, up the top we've got some nice uh, separately applied exhaust pipes that have been painted the correct colour. You can see the exhaust silencer is a different colour to the actual pipe. Um, this sort of red oxide colour was quite a common colour for exhaust systems on DMUs and you'll see uh, loads of them um, looking like that if you look up any prototype pictures. Here we can see some more separately applied detail. You've got uh, these metal bars that run up the ends of the uh, coach to the, uh, the top of the roof. Uh, I still don't know what they are. Um, they're present on most coaches, um, particularly Mark 1s and most uh, first generation DMUs. Um, no idea what they are, but it's nice that they're there. We've also got a very nice little piece of printed detail down here giving various information about that particular vehicle. Um, further up we've also got uh, a separately applied uh, decal for overhead warning, uh, for warning of any uh, overhead cables or anything that most units um, received during the 1980s. Here's a look at the other end of the uh, trailer unit and uh, looks just as good as the other end as you would hope. We've got all the usual stuff, all the separately applied detail, uh, the windscreen wipers I particularly like, they look really good. And uh, all of the, uh, the locks and the handles for the doors have all been separately, uh, uh, separately uh, pointed out in silver paint and uh, just uh, makes the model look even better. There's a quick look at the interior of first class for you. I imagine first class was put all the way at this end so you could be as far away from the engines as possible. Uh, so I imagine this was probably quite a quite a quiet and relaxing relaxing ride at this end. One of the best features in the model I think is all of this uh, roof detail that it's got. It really does look good. You've got all the uh, ventilators in there for the cabs, the interiors, and then you can see all of those rivets as well. That really does look good, gives the model a nice bit of realism. Looking underneath the DMU we can see that the uh, underframe detail has uh, been done to a very high standard, it looks very good and is typical of uh, most uh, Backman uh, first generation DMUs. You can see here we've got a nice representation of the uh, two battery boxes there, um, there's a few more bits of separately applied detail further along 
and uh, my favourite bit is the uh, the engine here. Um, there's one on each side of the uh, driving car, and uh, you can just about see um, the two rocker covers have just been moulded in as well, which is a really nice touch. Uh, the engines in these units were six cylinder, and they were nicknamed pancake engines because they were um, all the cylinders were laid over. Basically, the engine was a flat configuration. The idea being that it would uh, fit nicely underneath the floor of the unit and uh, be out of the way. And you can see the exhaust system for the engine rooting up into the body. That's nicely picked out and the exhaust system on the other side is even longer for the other engine as it is further forward. Coupling the two units together is achieved by means of a uh, plastic drawbar with electrical contacts in it, um, thus allowing you to um, electrically power both units with a single decoder. The model is driven by a, uh, a motor located in the uh, rear section of the uh, driving motor car here. Um, the motor powers a single bogey and um, is more than adequate at uh, moving the entire unit as it is around the layout at a reasonable pace. Okay, so uh, now I'll show you the um, taking the body off, fitting a decoder and uh, fitting the, uh, the front end detail uh, to the model. Okay, first things first, um, usual stuff that I always do. Um, you always get a bag of bits, so I'm gonna put those on. And uh, I've got a decoder over here, it's a lens 21 pin decoder, as you can see by this box. Um, and I've got some rocket card glue, uh, which I use for gluing the accessories to the buffer beam. Um, in the past I've used super glue, but it doesn't give you much margin for error because it dries very, very quickly. Um, rocket card glue glues most things to pretty much anything else, um, and it glues it strong enough to keep it there for a long time. Nice thing about it is you've got five, ten minutes to actually mess around and position whatever it is you're trying to put on. Always check the instructions for taking the body off. Um, these are typical Backman instructions. Always uh, do a reasonably good job. Um, we can see here that uh, at each end of the model there are two screws and then it appears that by those little uh, stars there that there are some clips that retain the body. Um, so as far as body removal is concerned it's just standard typical Backman um, DMU setup. Something I just noticed is there is a switch underneath uh, just there which allows you to turn off the interior lights. Um, while still being able to uh, use the uh, directional lights on each end of the cab. Um, that's quite a nice feature, um, it's something that um, quite a number of people have wanted for a few years. Um, would have been nice to put that as a function on the decoder, um, but at least there is provision for it now. You can at least do um, what you've wanted to do and turn the lights off. Personally, I just leave them on, I think they look good. Okay, well it's actually been almost half an hour later. Um, the body itself, actually by design, comes off quite easily. Um, it's not too bad. Uh, you just have to undo the four screws and then you can just uh, see them here. There's a couple of clips. Um, the body itself actually comes off relatively easily. I had an issue though, um, one of the screws at the back, you can see the two holes here where they go. They go up into the body shell. They screw into, uh, where are we? they screw into those two plastic tubes. Now those plastic tubes have a, a metal threaded insert glued into them so that the, the screws have something to grip onto. Um, unfortunately one of them had been put in so tight you can see all the screwdrivers I've had to use and tools to get it out. Um, I did eventually get it out but you can see at the end where all the threads are mashed um, so it was, it was put in very very tightly. It was very difficult to get off um, had I not had all these tools at my disposal, I may have ended up having to drill that screw out, um, which would have been annoying. Um, I'm not going to be able to use that screw again. Um, it doesn't really play a massive role in holding the body on. There's so many other screws and clips, so it'll be fine. Um, but if I really wanted to, I've got some spare screws upstairs and I can replace it. Uh, moving on, let's look at uh, the, uh, the actual mechanics of the model. Um, Already there are some noticeable improvements over previous DMUs um, that Backman have employed on here, um, chief among which is uh, this, this area along here, this uh, light bar um, system. Previously that has always been suspended in the roof of the body shell. It would be along here where the blue roof is and at the end you would have some copper contacts um, on uh, some springs, they'd be sort of springed out and then there would be some uh, 
some long terminals um, that stuck up at either end of the model and when you put the body on you would rely on the contact between those pieces of metal um, to get the lights working. Um, they are a little bit finicky, um, I've had trouble with one of my 108s when I've taken it apart. Um, getting the body sat properly, um, getting the lights to work can be quite a fiddly process. By wiring the lights directly um, to the uh, circuit board underneath the interior, um, they've eliminated that problem. The lights are part of the chassis. Um, so that's quite a nice improvement. That's uh, going to make um, putting the body on a lot easier because I don't have to worry about lining up any lights and anything. It's all, it's all part of the chassis, as are the uh, front headlights here. So that's a nice improvement. Current collection is done um, using the typical Backman Manor. Um, what you have is a bogey here. You can see the pickups underneath. They uh, collect power from the uh, bearings at the end of the um, axle. And they come up through the centre there. And then what happens is underneath you've got two contacts um, that those two touch and they allow the bogey to still swivel. That's been the uh, traditional methods um, that Backmen have employed ever since they brought out the 108 for collecting power on DMUs um, and I imagine it will be a similar system um, for any lit coaches that come out in the near future. Lit coaches seem to be a, a new new thing that uh, manufacturers are starting to employ. Um, Hornby are doing it with their Mark III coaches and uh, Backman are going to be doing it in their forthcoming Mark II F coaches. Um, which is a welcome addition. Um, I've fitted lights to many carriages and uh, it's quite a long and lengthy process. If I could spend a couple of pounds extra on a carriage and get the lighting installed already, that would be a nice bonus. Moving to the back, the uh, the motor and gearbox is obviously in this uh, metal case. Um, I'm not going to bother unscrewing it because I don't need to, uh, but uh, that that's where all that is housed and that is um, hidden inside the uh, the guards compartment of the uh, the driving driving section of the DMU. Um, uh, DCC provision is uh, located here. It's uh, recessed down slightly so um, it fits. You'll be able to fit fairly large decoders in there. Uh, previously, um, these have all been 8 pin. Um, you would have a socket towards the rear end and there would be a recess in the top of this motor compartment um, to fit the decoder. Um, it's a very, 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 very tight fit in uh, things like Backman 108s. Um, even the Backman 8-pin decoder, which is what they'll obviously recommend you use on models like that, that doesn't actually fit. You have to trim the uh, jacket that it sits in quite a lot. Um, so again, a nice bit of uh, common sense has been applied for decoder provision. So we've got lights that make sense and uh, better fitment of decoder. So it seems to be that the... Uh, the idea um, for doing the first generation DMU chassis has remained largely the same because it works pretty well, um, but they've just streamlined certain areas just to ensure that extra level of reliability. If we move to the back of the model we can see yet another welcome addition. Um, this model only requires one decoder for operation. Um, you can see down here for the coupling um, that we've got some metal contacts that go through to the second car. Um, so that's very welcome, that means you don't have to buy two decoders to uh, run the model. Um, or for instance if they were to do a free car version of this um, you would have needed free decoders. Um, that's certainly the case with the Backman Class 108 DMU that they launched some years ago. Um, this first appeared on the Backman Class 150 and I expect on any uh, units now that they make it will be the standard um, method of connection um, such as the Blue Pullman, um, the Forcep and various other uh, more recent multi-vehicle uh, units that you can now purchase. You can see on the top you've got the two cables going to that um, little piece of metal on the top that screws to the, uh, the coupling. Uh, underneath there's a little uh, spring that keeps it centred and you can see that as the unit goes left and right those uh, cables are kept in the right place. It seems to work reasonably well, time will tell. I've also noticed that um, 
the uh, optional um, interior lighting on and off switch is present in this car also. Um, so there are two switches, there is one here on the trailer and there is one on the driving trailer. Um, so if you want to turn the interior lights off you actually have to operate both switches on each end um, which strikes me as a little odd because they are linked by a connection so I'm, I'm assuming it's some circuitry reason why you have to do that. On reflection having two switches is slightly annoying um, it would be nice if it was just a function of the uh, decoder there are loads of decoders out there that support all sorts of functions so I'm sure it wouldn't have been too difficult tailor the circuit board um, to suit those needs. Um, for example on uh, Backman diesels um, function 1 turns the cab lights on or off um, and function 0 turns the running lights on and off so why you couldn't have 0 turning the running lights on the DMU and function 1 turning on the interior lights I don't know. Um, however I test I just leave them on personally I think they look alright so um, it, it doesn't bother me um, but that might be a bit of an issue for you next thing to do is to uh, delve into the bag of bits and fit the various accessories. Uh, I always do that. Uh, I always like to have the uh, piping and extra detail added on the model where I can. Um, with the diesels I tend to put all the detail on one end and fit a coupling on the other. And with the DMUs um, I tend to uh, put as much detail as I can on either end. Um, I typically don't couple the DMUs together apart from the uh, two class 108s. So I'll only couple DMUs together that are of the uh, the same type. Um, I imagine most of the time when I run this it'll be as a single unit. I've taken off the couplings including the NEM pocket. It just makes the front of the units much cleaner to look at and I'll uh, go ahead and fit the additional detail. So a quick look at the uh, bits that need to go on. The corresponding holes on the front of the unit. Uh, they go on in that order. Um, you've got uh, two hoses, um, nice scale coupling, an electrical connection and then there's also another pipe uh, connection um, that goes on there. And that, uh, you can see there's uh, three holes on the lower side of the buffer beam on the left and there's uh, three holes in the center. That's where all the pieces need to go. I've now programmed the uh, decoder. Um, it's got 128 speed steps. Uh, locomotive address has been changed to uh, locomotive 26 and uh, I have adjusted the acceleration rates um, to make the unit uh, pull away and slow down nice and smoothly. So all that remains now is to uh, take it around the layout and uh, run it in. I usually run locomotives in for about half an hour in, in each direction. Um, if I feel a locomotive is still a bit jerky or juddery, um, I might run it in for a longer period of time. So we just change direction. model has directional lights and it also has all those cab interior lights that I showed you earlier. And as mentioned previously, if you do want to turn those off, there is a switch underneath each car which will allow you to do so. Straight away the slow speed performance is very very good. Uh, I'll do a really slow pass shortly uh, just to get an idea of how good that is. But uh, considering it's uh, not really run at all yet, it is running very very smoothly. Right, well I'll speed it up a little bit and let it run in. Negotiated all the uh, point work in the fiddle yard, no problem at all. Um, this area can be a real test for some locomotives as I have these switchback curves that come off of the helix. But, uh, most of the Backman DMUs seem to do absolutely fine. Um, they're relatively short, quite lightweight, and their bogies have a lot of movement, so it turns pretty well. Right, I was going to show you the slow speed performance, but it's actually moving so slowly that it's going to take ages to come into shot. So I shall move the camera. And there you go. I don't think you could uh, really ask it to go any slower than that, to be honest. That's excellent slow speed performance. 
It's a quality mechanism in there. Just pulling it into the station now so you can get a look at the interior lights. It's all currently set on the brightest possible setting, so I may adjust it later on because it is a little bit intense. But you can see the lighting does look very nice. And more importantly, it's got the really nice yellowing to the lights um, that was very common during the era in which these units operated. Clear white lighting is only something that has been around for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, old lights really did have that yellowy glow to them and it's nice that it's been represented on the model. You can also see the destination blind uh, illuminated at the end as well. I think Backman have done a very nice job with the Class 101 DMU. It's a very important prototype that uh, is very good for uh, all sorts of layouts, certainly very appropriate to mine. Uh, I hope in the future that they bring out a free or four car variant, it would be nice to see that, and uh, also some additional liveries such as the uh, Network Southeast and uh, various other liveries that they would have operated in throughout the 1990s up until 2003. In the future I hope that uh, more first generation DMUs are produced, um, Backman seems to have a knack for doing a nice job of them, so in the future I'd quite like to see a Class 117 free car DMU in Network Southeast colour scheme. Uh, that was a very, very, very um, typical site on the western region. Um, those units operated out of Paddington and Reading um, throughout the uh, 1980s, right up until sort of 1990 when they were eventually replaced by the 165 and 166 turbo units. So I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, the review. This really is a very nice model and I'm thoroughly impressed with it. And uh, I will be back soon with more videos on the layout.